turn with me to Luke's Gospel, please. Chapter 10. We'll read 1 through 11 and then we'll jump over to 16. all kinds of stuff has just happened in Jesus' life. He first sent out his disciples two by two, similar to the story that we're going to read today, and then he gives issues the call if anyone wants to be my disciple, take up his cross and follow me, and then he goes up in that mountain to pray where he is transfigured um, so brightly um, embraced by the love and the presence of God that he glowed. And uh, remember the disciple Peter says, Jesus, this is good. Let's stay up here. I'll build us some tents and we can stay forever. And Jesus said, no, we have to go down. And as soon as Jesus went down from the mountain, there were those waiting for him. There were those who needed his touch still. Um, and so there's all kinds of wonderful things happening just before this. And so after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. I am sending you like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals. Do not greet anyone on the road. And when you enter a house, first say, Peace to this house. If the one living there is peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking, wherever they give you, whatever they give you. For the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcome, to eat what is set before you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. But when you enter a town and you are not welcome, Go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that sticks to our feet, we wipe off against you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God is near. And then jump down to verse 16. 16. Those who listen to you, listen to me. Those who reject you, reject me. But those who reject me, reject him who sent me. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons... Submit to us in your name. And Jesus replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Brothers and sisters, this is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, we want to thank you and praise you, give you glory for you are worthy of our honor and our praise. Today, let it be that we give you honor and glory, not just in what we say, but in how we feel in our hearts and in our attitudes and in our willingness to stand up for our faithfulness in Jesus Christ, to be heard in very simple moments and places and to be heard for your kingdom in places that even have greater significance where we can touch many, many lives. Let us touch and reach and live for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We love you and we thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. How about this call? This is an amazing call to go. And there are all kinds of songs that are written. There are all kinds of words that are used to call us to go and to serve Jesus Christ over and over and over again through Scripture. Jesus commands us to go. He commands us to reach out every single one of us in every single situation. There is never a time in your life when you are exempt from living for Jesus Christ. So if you have another idea about what it means to be a Christian, like I can show up on Sunday, 
and live the way I want to on Sunday, um, the way I think that God wants me to, and then check out the rest of the week, you're missing the point. You're missing not just the point, but you're missing the blessing. Jesus commands us to go, and his call isn't always easy. Yet he promises that he's always with us. One of my earliest um, significant uh, remembrances of going in Jesus' name was right after I was ordained um, into ministry. Uh, I had gone to seminary, completed my work there, and, and fulfilled my internship and had been appointed to a church. I was going to be associate pastor of a big church in Yorktown, and that was going to happen in June. And then I got the invitation to go to Africa with the Voices of Youth. That's the conference choir that um, does a trip every year, either a domestic trip, they do a mission, and they do um, music at the same time. And um, I was so excited. They invited me to go with them to um, Zimbabwe. And so, really, the day that I was ordained, I got on a bus later that day, and even though I had been appointed to be associate pastor of that church in Yorktown, my first congregation was 40 youth and 12 chaperones that were headed to Zimbabwe. It was really awesome to be able to travel with them. Um, Americans do not travel light. I found that out traveling with this bunch of kids. Um, and apparently that was quite a shock for our host when we got to Zimbabwe because for 40 um, kids and 12 adults, they brought one truck to carry our luggage. And so we had luggage underneath our legs and we were cramped. It was a five hour drive to Africa University um, in Mutare where we were staying. Um, from the airport, and um, we had luggage everywhere, and it still didn't all fit. And so some of us had to leave our luggage behind. And we got to Africa University. We arrived there in the evening, had our dinner and our, our evening worship, and, and went to bed. And somewhere in the middle of the night, I heard this wonderful voice. It was the voice of our host, Patrick Metzikaneri who was the music director at Africa University, very well known throughout the world for his hymn writing and his directing and teaching people how to praise God. And Patrick's voice was so pleasing and his sweet African accent, I thought, isn't that sweet Patrick's walking up and down the halls giving us a blessing? And I thought, that's some really cool African tradition I don't know about, but I'm going to remember that. And then when I really shook myself awake enough to realize what he was saying, he was saying, your luggage has arrived. Please come and retreat. <laughs> um, and it tickled me because I thought, well, that's, you know, certainly something that uh, we think we have to have everything um, that we want at our fingertips. You know, we all had our hair dryers. We all had our 15 pairs of clothes. And we were traveling for a month after all. Americans need a lot of stuff, don't we? We need a lot of stuff. So when Jesus calls the disciples to go, when he calls these 72 followers of his, and I'm surmising that those are people who heard Jesus sharing the gospel and couldn't help but drop everything and give their lives to follow after him. We're, we're not told exactly a list of who whose name was was among those 72 called, but I can just gather that they were people who just were the faithful church of Jesus and really wanted to learn and really wanted to be a part of what he was doing. And so Jesus, uh, he's been schooling them just like he's been schooling the disciples. And there's sort of this um, internship that he sends them on when he says, I'm sending you out two by two. So let's talk about that first. What is it like to be sent two by two? When we were um, on the Eastern Shore with our youth, I made them um, have a buddy system for like if, if they were going to go shopping or if we were at the beach because I, I worry a lot when we take groups of kids to the beach. I, I don't want to come back <coughs> one short at all. <laughs> and so I feel like I'm constantly counting heads in the, in, the, in the water. And the best way for me to do that is just to be out there with them. So I'm out there swimming with them and I'm counting. But I also know that they're watching for each other because they have a buddy. So if my buddy's going to walk down the beach, I'm going to either walk down the beach with them or I'm going to keep my eye and I'm going to know where they are so that when Michelle comes to me and says, where's your buddy? I can say, oh, they just went for a walk down the beach with another person's buddy. They'll be right back. And, and there's a reason for having a buddy system. 
somebody's got to have your back. Somebody has got to have your back. People were not made to be solitary. We are meant to live in community. Even people who take vows of silence, even people who take vows of um, never marrying, people who give their lives to God, they still live in community. We are meant to be with one another and to do God's work with one another. African University, where I visited that year so many years ago, is a good example of that. You think about wanting to build a, a, a university of higher education in a foreign country, a third world country, and you think, oh my goodness, that's too huge. Who could do that? But Methodists from all over the world have united together, and we have in our apportionments that African University Fund. And if those of you who work with our administrative ministries, you see that come in here on our apportionments. That's a part of what we um, are doing with our gifts because we're a part of a church that's bigger than just Wesley Chapel. And so where one small group can never build a university or a hospital or a school or a clinic, Together with other people, we can do amazing things. And Jesus knows that we need each other. And so he sent them out two by two. Somebody's got your back. We're going to work together for the gospel. He sends them out two by two. And he says, this is the part that I would have a really hard time with. Take nothing with you. Don't take an extra tunic. Don't take any money. Don't take any extra sandals. I'm talking about walk people who walk everywhere they go. Girls, you cannot change outfits, so you don't even really need another pair of shoes. But if you did, you couldn't carry them with you because Jesus said, go two by two and don't take anything with you. I would say, can I at least take a fanny pack for my cell phone? What would you want to take with you? I mean, if you were told to pack light, how big would your bag be? Think about it. Pack light. I'm sending you on a mission. How big is how big is your bag, Summer? Is it a truckload? <coughs> yeah. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> pack light. The lightest I've ever packed for um, a mission trip is a suitcase like this big and like this big around because I need my stuff and I don't know where I'm going to be able to buy stuff when I go to Africa or Haiti or even eastern shore of Virginia. i got to take stuff because I'm going to need stuff. Jesus says, don't take any stuff. I'm going to provide everything that you need. And when you go, speak peace. There's something about um, speaking peace in the name of Jesus Christ that is so much greater a greeting than, hey, y'all, how you doing? You know what I'm saying? When we do, sometimes as a congregation, pass the peace, I will often say to you, now, this is not a time to catch up on the neighborhood news. This is a time where you are speaking the blessing of Jesus Christ to another person. Isn't that different? That's way different than, hey, y'all. That's why Jesus says, um, don't stop along the road. That sounds a little snooty at first, doesn't it? Don't stop along the road. Well, it was a custom at that point, and it's a custom for us. If you're driving down the road and you see somebody you know, you wave. And if they're close enough to the road, you probably stop and roll down your window and have a conversation, don't you? Or you ride, if you live in Eagle Cove, you ride around in your little golf cart, and you stop at the other golf cart, or the person in their yard working, you stop and have a conversation, because that's what friends do. Jesus said, keep focused. Keep focused. Don't dilly-dally along the way. I'm sending you for a purpose to bring my peace. Don't take anything. Go two by two and touch a life. And don't dilly-dally along the way because I have work for you to do. And when you get there, speak peace. Now, there's lots of us who grew up as the peacekeepers. How many of you are the peacekeeper in your family? I totally am the peacekeeper, and I don't know if that's a younger child thing. In my family, it's, I think it's part of being the younger child, but you know who you are if you're the peacekeeper. Well, let me first of all say, Jesus said peacekeepers are blessed. So <laughs> if you ever get tired of being the peacekeeper, just remember that Jesus said you are blessed. And here's the reality. Every single one of you should have raised your hand because we should all be the peacekeeper in our family, in our homes, in our neighborhoods in our countries, in our world. 
Jesus says we're blessed. Jesus says when you offer peace, he doesn't say stick around and be a doormat. He says if your peace rests upon the house where you offer it, then stay there. Stay there as long as you're able to and receive whatever blessing is bestowed upon you. On my very first international mission trip, my mom and I went to Haiti and um, we had sponsored children through the Baptist Haiti mission for school and we actually got to meet some of those kids and go to their home. And one home, there were two little boys and both of their parents had died and so they were being raised by their grandparents and they lived in a little two room concrete house. Um, which was a lot nicer than a lot of the houses um, that we had seen along the road. Sometimes it's just a thatched hut that people live in, even still now. Um, but we went into their house, and they had only two chairs in their whole house, and they had like a little hibachi like in the center of the floor. And they immediately jumped up and insisted that my mother and I sit in the only two chairs in the house. It was very dark in the room. The only light was from the door that was open and from the little hibachi that had some hot coals on it. And this house, they were probably a little more wealthy than a lot of people because they had electricity, but they only had one light bulb. I don't know why that struck me so amazing, but they only had one light bulb. So they ran into the other room where we could see light coming out and they unscrewed their one light bulb and brought it into the room where we were their one light bulb in their one room with, with heat, in their one room with chairs. It was the most humbling and amazing hospitality I have ever received in my entire life. When you have people in your home, what do you want for them? Can I offer you something to drink? We were just getting ready to have a meal, pull up a chair, or have a snack. Or please, sit down in the best chair. Get up and offer them your recliner, people. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, offer it. That's the kind of hospitality we offer to our friends and people that we love. Come into our house. Why wouldn't we offer that kind of hospitality to strangers or even receive that kind of hospitality from strangers? <coughs> Let me just tell you if someone offers you hospitality like that, don't be too humble to receive it. Because a lot of times we'll go, no, no, keep your seat then you're not allowing them the blessing of giving you their, their very best. You know what I'm saying? When you're offered hospitality, receive it graciously. God bless you. Peace be with you. Peace bless your household. Everywhere that we go, we should be able to speak the peace of Jesus Christ. Now, some of you will say, I've been working really hard at being a peacemaker, and all that happens is that I get taken advantage of. Here's where Jesus empowers us to not be taken advantage of. He says, if you go somewhere with the message of the peace of Jesus Christ and your message is not received, then go into the city, the center of the city, and make an example, not just to that person, but go to the city and say, I shake the dust from my feet and go forth for Jesus Christ. So what does that call us to today? This is a huge calling of trust. Trust to depend that wherever God is sending us, God has already gone there before us and made preparations for our hospitality, made preparations for our provision, made preparations for the spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ. All we have to do is go. I remember around the time that the earthquakes hit Haiti a number of years ago, it was the first time that I heard this song by Chris Tomlin, You're the God of the City. Have you ever heard that? You're the God of the city. You're the king of these people. You're the Lord of this nation. You are. You, God, are the light in the darkness. You are the hope to the hopeless. You are the peace to the rest restless. You are. There is no one like our God. Greater things have yet to come, and greater things are still to be done in this city. Greater things have yet to come, and greater things are still to be done here. You know, any place that you go, 
you're able to take that message because God has something greater for us here at Wesley Chapel. If you know where there is violence, go and stand up and say, God has something greater than violence. Greater things are yet to come and greater things are still to be done here. If you know of a place where there is hatred, you go and you stand and you say, greater things have yet to come and greater things are still to be done here in this place. If you are in a place where there is sickness, you go and you stand and you pray with faith and you say, greater things are yet to be done and greater things are still to be done here in this place because God is not so I don't know about you, I think it's kind of hard to accept the calling to be sent sometimes. I think it's hard to not pack my big suitcase full of stuff, and I'm not talking literal here. I could come up with all kinds of reasons and all kinds of things and all kinds of baggage that I need to take with me, and Jesus says, leave that behind. Jesus, I can't go there because the last time I was there, I was ridiculed and I was not received. Jesus said, leave that baggage behind and trust that I'm going to meet you there. You might say, Jesus, I have given my all to this relationship and it has never worked before. Why should I go now and get stepped on again? Jesus says, leave that baggage behind one more time. If I'm sending you there, I'm going to meet you there. And if the message is not received, there are certainly places where God has you to go. Where God surely has greater things to do. So God has great things to happen here in our town, in our county. And God is calling us. I want you to pull out your yellow piece of paper today. And let me share um, two, two things that are coming up in the life of this church and in our community that I want to invite you to be a part of. Because God is calling us to go. If you weren't a part of our church a year ago, you won't know of this, but um, last year we had our very first worship and service day. It, it was truly an inspirational idea. Uh, truly only could have come from God because it was such an amazing thing that happened here. I, I was praying on the way to church one day and I said, Lord, how can we get more people excited about doing something for you? And the idea was we need to let people in our community know that we're here. And we need to let people know in our community that we love them. And even if it's just one gesture for one day, let us let people know that we care about what's going on in their lives. So we were so excited from last year. Last year we had 100 people at least involved in this. Now, And there was really no way to calculate if that was 100 people who brought stuff and stayed and worked or 100 people who just worked. But at one point we counted down in the Smith Center when everybody was working in their stations and we had over 100 people working and then deployed. So here's what we're going to do. On September the 11th, isn't that a neat day to have this fall? 9-11. On 9-11, we are going to worship Outside, we're going to move it this year to this side so we don't have to contend with the sign and the traffic. So we're improving this idea. We're going to be worshiping outside because we want our community to know that we're here. We want them to hear us sing. We want them to drive by and say, hmm, something's happening there. Maybe I should check into it. So we're going to worship at 10 o'clock. And then at a little bit before 11 o'clock, we're going to deploy. We're going to, we're going to go back in the Smith Center. We're going to put together um, exam snacks, study snacks for students at VSU. We're going to put together bag lunches for the men at the Salvation Army. We're going to deploy the choir to go to the Dinwiddie Rehab Center. We're going to prepare lunches because it's 9-11. What a great day to honor our service person and our emergency care workers. So we're going to deploy teams to three different firehouses in our area and to the Chesterfield um, County Jail to serve the deputies and the firemen a lunch. Now we first thought, well, we'll buy some barbecue and pans. Well, now it's going to be homemade barbecue. And it's going to be homemade slaw. And it's going to be homemade rolls. It's going to be homemade cookies because you're doing that. Because people, when we work for Jesus Christ, people deserve the very best that we can offer. Greater things are yet to come. And greater things are still to be done. Will you be a part of it? Yes. Will you be a part of it? Yes. Yeah. Thanks be to God. There's another thing on the back side. On October 1st, we've been invited by... Um, it, it all started, and BJ can tell you better because he's been our 
relations person with this team, but it all started with a bunch of folks at the Matoka Baptist Church who were in Bible study and who felt that God was calling them to do more than just have Bible study by themselves, but that God was calling them to get out into the community and somehow minister to people and just let them know that God loves them here in this community. Not for any church to be working to get members, but for churches in our community to come together to serve our community. And so on October 1st, it's going to be Community Day in Matoka, and it'll be down at Matoka Christian Fellowship. And you see, there's going to be all kinds of things, and it's all free, just for people to know um, that they are, are loved by Jesus Christ right here in Matoka. Greater things are yet to come. And greater things are yet to be done here. Will you be a part? Yes. yes. Will you be a part of what Jesus wants to do in this church and in this community? Will you? Yes. Let us pray. God, we thank you that you call us still today. And you command us to go. It's easy, God, for us to hide away and to... Um, not want to be involved in something that calls us out of our comfort zone. That's easy. You never called us to easy, but you never called us to alone either. You've called us into a community of believers who are supposed to live as a community of believers so that others too may come to know you. God, I pray for this congregation and their generosity and their love and their desire to serve you. I pray for opportunities that you give us um, to serve you. I pray for an opportunity to give somebody a bottle of water and say, Jesus loves you. I pray for an opportunity to give somebody a homemade cookie and say, Jesus loves you, and, and so we made you something homemade. I thank you, God, for opportunities to go and to reach and to touch your kingdom. So bless us, God. Wesley Chapel Church, those of us in this very room, those of us who aren't in this very room at this very moment, but we want to be a part of what you're doing, God. Forgive us when we Help us to make a difference for someone. Thank you, God. We love you. We praise you. We thank you for all the opportunities. In Jesus' name. Amen.